Baker, would you also be prepared for us to have the vote? Our gracious Heavenly Father, let us thank you for this day and this beautiful weather and that we can come together and, and be guided by you to do your work for the, the church and people. And bless each and every one here as they travel to their distant homes after this meeting. You've been traveling grace and uh, each of the, the audience and, and just guide and direct us and forgive us of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, next we have roll call. Julia Kent? Here. Tom Garvin? Okay. Bill Anglin? Here. Bill John Baker? Here. Jack Baker? Here. Harley Bowser? Here. Brad McCall? Joe Crittenden? <coughs> Jody Fishinghop? Meredith Braley? Danielle Fulbright? Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Connor Glory Jordan? Present. Curtis Snell? Here. Chris Soap? Here. David Thornton? Present. Kara Callan Watts? Bahami. Uh-huh. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, next, we have approval of the minutes of the session. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We will move to reports, and first we have uh, Career Services, Diane Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Coates. Uh, I just want to invite everybody over to the Talk and Leaf Job Corps. We're having our 30 year anniversary. Uh, all of our activities kick off tomorrow at 1 o'clock outside, possibly, but if it rains, we're going to the gym. Uh, we've got uh, speakers and we've got uh, our alumni reception tomorrow afternoon. Then there's a powwow scheduled tomorrow night. Our students are putting that on. And then on Thursday, to close everything out, we have a traditional hog fry. And if you haven't had Frank R. Nature and Woody Wilson's hog meat, well, they're fixing the hog meat Thursday. So that's what the kids are doing for their 30 year anniversary. Y'all are invited over uh, to that event. We're letting our kids do a lot of the planning on this. Um, I'm going to have to leave here in a few minutes. I'm going over to meet with Michael Lynn and Robert Endicott. We're looking at a area over there where we can develop our pad for our trucking. We're going to do a trucking program on the back side of the uh, Job Corps Center. There was uh, the land behind there was leased to Career Services and we're looking at a pad and Michael seems to think they've got some asphalt that they could pack down to do our driving range. We're going over to meet with them on that at 2. I asked Brenda Fitzgerald, who is our manager over vocational training and voc rehab, to stay during the meeting. So if there's some questions, I would defer to her if you have some questions that you may not ask me before I leave. Uh, Dr. Neil Morton and I have been doing a lot of collaboration. Um, the Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> is one of the events that we're working on. We've been in contact with all of the Boys and Girls Clubs in the 14 County area, and I wish Dr. Cobb was here, but I'm sure somebody can relay this on to him. Bartlesville has been included, and they will be here. On November the 6th, which is on a Thursday, we are planning a meeting that morning. We have a reception planned for them, and we're also going to be asking programs to put up displays in the complex and uh, bring information that the uh, Boys and Girls Club units can share and exchange business cards. We're asking that the Boys and Girls Clubs invite their, those units. If uh, prior Votech has about seven or eight schools that they're working with, we ask that prior invite representatives from each of those schools to come to the complex so that they can see what is available in terms of resources here at the Cherokee Nation that some of their families or some of their students can take advantage of. Because there, is, there are scholarship programs, there's our summer youth employment program, our internship program, the Cherokee Choir, there's all different kinds of resources, but they don't know what we have. So we're extending an invitation for them to come that morning, exchange business cards, pick up information. Uh, then uh, we have a luncheon planned, and then we will be giving out their uh, Boys and Girls Club checks. And you all will be invited to come and have lunch with them that day and know who they are because there's a lot of impact there with these families that these kids represent. And uh, we'll be able to get the invitations out on that here in the next week or so. Uh, another thing that we're collaborating on are the uh, footballs. Uh, we went out to some of the schools. Brenda and Janice Grogan with Higher Ed have got a report. I believe Dr. Cobb had asked for this report. Excuse me. 
Councilman Allen. <clears throat> this is the report. Uh, Brenda's here. She can answer any questions, and education's here as well. If y'all have any questions about their participation, um, <clears throat> I think there was some discussion about them going out for some of the basketball games, and I'll defer that to them. Um, Kim Carroll, who works in my office, was nominated to serve on the United States Department of Labor Native American Employment and Training Council. It's a 20-member uh, council where there are representatives who work on you know, redesigning uh, the uh, regulations or some of the performance standards. And Kim's name was submitted by the group in Oklahoma. Uh, we received a, a letter from Elaine Chow, who is the Secretary of Labor, that she uh, has been appointed to serve on that advisory committee. So she will be working with them on redesigning some of our regulations for our 102477 program in our Department of Labor and Employment Training Programs. Uh, there was application, or not applications, but flyers that went out about our GED site locations. Somebody had asked for that at one of the meetings. Those have gone out. And uh, we are in the process of starting some training programs at the Indian Capital Votech School in Stillwell. Uh, we have a uh, security guard training pro program going on, and they will start within the next week uh, training and hospitality. Uh, we're trying to gear up for the uh, casino operations, and we'll also be doing this up at Little Kansas later on. Uh, we're trying to assist them with some of the training. Uh, and I want to share with those council members who met with us this morning. We don't let grass grow under our feet. I met with Kelly Forrest and five members of uh, my employment and training staff who had already had some training in social and life skills classes. Uh, we will be setting those classes up, and we're going to pull Kelly out of the classroom and put a um, locum tenant in there in the classroom for about two or three weeks to allow her time to work with those five people that we've identified. We will be starting some social and life skills classes for those people that are going to be actually referred to some of these jobs because we've got several businesses outside Cherokee Nation that we're being asked to help recruit for and we want to make sure that those people are work keys tested but we also want to tell them about what what to expect make sure they're on time that they're there uh, on the job and not missing work and so uh, one of the things that we brought up in the meeting this morning was that we need to be doing more of that so we're going to start trying to uh, address that are there any questions Councilor yes, uh uh, have you been contacted at all uh, to uh, do any coordination or consultation with them and all there in fire? Yes, we have. And, uh, if so, is there, what, what's the plan there to uh, help any Cherokee workers or any other workers for that matter that may be able to fill some of our labor needs at the Cherokee Nation? When the uh, announcement came out on the news uh, that night, uh, Don Berger had emailed everybody that's on his mailing right. list, and there was a meeting set up, I think, the following day. Nettie Deathridge is our point person, and Nettie was there in prior. She and Rob Doherty the very next day, and they are working with the prior Mid-America Industrial Park, and we will be helping to coordinate a job fair for those people and bringing in other jobs in the area that is, is going to need help. Uh, we've also been contacted by uh, Gatorade because they're shutting down for a while and they're going to regroup and may lay some people off as well. Right. And then uh, we were told today that Gates Rubber in uh, Salem Springs is also going to be uh, laying people off. They're moving some of their operation to Mexico. So we've got several businesses out there that are, are looking to lay off but we've got two new ones that are coming into Adair County. One is an AERT project, and the other one is a Calazon company out of the old Tyson's plant. So where there's businesses going out, we got others coming in, but it may mean that we're going to have to look at doing some retraining for some of these jobs that are coming about. Have you talked to Brian at all? Is, what's, is uh, Brian Collins, has he uh, indicated any opportunities whatsoever? Because those are similar type. Uh, in, uh, reference the lab and all those are similar type industries. So I was just curious if he's uh, contacted you at all, or, or if you are aware of any type of uh, opportunities that might exist 
We will make a point of getting with Brian to see if there could be some transportation worked out for those people. Because I know when CNI did a shutdown, a lot of those employees went over to Lavanoff for a short period of time. And it may be that we can do the same thing for some of those people that are already trained in that area. I was just curious. I think you guys are working on it. That's a good point. We will visit with him about it. Collaboration there from that unit. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Bowman? Yes. Diane, do you have any dates as to when the security guard training may take place in Little Kansas? They've already completed one group, and we are going to look at probably after the first of the year. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on Catoosa and Siloam up there at Little Kansas, because they could go in either direction. And then a follow-up question. Have you contacted Atten Vocate as far as security guard training or the training that you offer? I think we're missing a group of people up there that may not go to Catoosa or West Siloam Springs, but there are several casinos in that particular area that might employ some security guards. Okay. I will visit with Nettie and ask her to follow up with the people at Atten and see if we can't set something up there at Atten. Thank you. Any other questions? We're having a really bad problem in Siloam with the layoff at Fort Warner. That was our biggest employment besides Strickland Nation, and they did about $350 now. They're running between $30 and $40. And I just get calls all the time, and, you know, I've referred some to you, and I don't know how we could retrain those men. They've been there like 30 years, and I just wondered if we could have something like you mentioned, security guard training down in that area. Okay. All right. We will look into it. Ms. Wilbrock. Also, Whirlpool is shutting down, too, so that's another one that we're working on. I know. I know. They're moving first. Yeah. So we've got several plans in the area, and the other thing that I was speaking to Councilman Thornton about is the employment service. I don't know if you know this or not, but the state has projected 60 to 80 cuts in the state with the Oklahoma Employment Security Commission, and I think you can visit with Councilman Thornton because his son works for them. They have moved their location. They were in the same building with us, and they've moved over to the Votech, which is really not on the beaten path now, and we're still getting people coming to our office. And if Employment Security Commission goes out the door, then you can't access those tax credits with those people who fall into that category for those businesses that are looking to get those tax breaks. So it would behoove each of you to contact your state senator or your state representative to ensure that they maintain those offices here in northeast Oklahoma because we've got a lot of industry here on the border of the state of Arkansas and Oklahoma, but we don't have the luxury of having those offices or those people there on a daily basis. In Ada County, they've shut down and went to one day a week, and it's really hampering us from getting those tax credits with those businesses. So I would encourage you to contact your state representative and your state senator because they're the ones that can mandate those offices to be out there for us. Any other questions? I just want to commend you on the great job you did for Calazon. Well, it took a lot of people involved in that. We're still not there yet, but it's coming. And I want to thank you all for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The director's report, Dr. Horne. Thank you, and good afternoon. You have our written reports. I would entertain questions. Before I do that, if I may, I would like to introduce a couple of one new employee and one employee that is in a different position. We have Teresa Barbo, who is a higher ed special assistant. We have been shorthanded in the higher ed office for about three or four months, so we're in good shape now. And then we have Mandy Scott, who has been an administrative assistant with the department for a couple of years, and Mandy has assumed a new role as director of planning and strategy. So we're at full force now in education. 
So if you have questions, I'd be happy to uh, attempt to answer. Any questions? One thing that came up last time about uh, a report by uh, about November the 1st concerning higher education, uh, I have an outline of a proposed report that we plan to have ready for you on November the 3rd, Jennifer. And if you would take the report and, you know, rather than take the time now to, to go through it, but take go through it at your leisure and add items that you would like to have added to the report, something about higher ed. We got together uh, in the higher ed office and in my office and uh, outlined what we think are the most common questions that have arisen in the past uh, several months about higher education. So that would be the outline of report that we will have ready for you. Also, two persons listed on your agenda for reports are absent today. Uh, Gina Stanley uh, is, is on campus at Sequoia, but we have some persons there looking at uh, some uh, new additions to one of our uh, buildings, so she's tied up with, uh, with them. And also, um, Gloria Sly is on uh, travel status. Thank you. Mr. Buzzard? Uh, Dr. Morgan, I think there's Dr. a question. Morgan, I, I know we talked a little bit about this before, and I was concerned about the dropout rate for our college six mm -hmm. And uh, have you had a chance to work up something on maybe some recommendations of what we can do? To what we're doing uh, now, in fact, involved uh, this week and will be involved uh, another week or so until we put this report together. We're doing a, a, we have a phone bank. We're doing a, we're phoning uh, the home phone and the phone of the uh, applicant. To, on many instances, we have both of those numbers to uh, try to determine, you know, why did you drop out of school? And it, it will be included in that November report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have Head Start and Ms. Thompson. Are there any questions on my written report? Any questions? Good. If not, I have good news. Um, I can't believe it's that time of year again, but I would like to invite you all to our traditional Thanksgiving dinner in November if you all uh, want to have meetings up there that day. So. November 10th. Is that the next education you meeting? Pardon me. Yeah. November 10th is an all-day meeting. Maybe we could stay at lunch. Right. Well, usually you have your meetings up there. Oh, yeah. Somebody can let me know. We're going to do all-day meetings on November 10th. Can you take care of us all day? We typically, <laughs> I mean, it, the meetings are there all day. We're not at cookies and milk in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> if I spoil you, you have to spoil, I'll spoil you all the way. <laughs> okay, I'll just wait up to hear from uh, Gail or someone. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Butler Allen, J O N. Good afternoon. We have my report on our, are there any questions? JOM, the partner. Any questions? Wanted to remind you just an announcement, and I think it is in our the monthly report, that we will be having our Cherokee Language Bowl competitions uh, next week, next Tuesday and Thursday. Once again, we've moved it from NSU back to our tribal um, <coughs> complex. So I think there will be three rooms going each of the competition days. So please feel free to sit in on one of the uh, one of the matches and uh, see what our kids are learning. Appreciate it. Thank you. And um, Ms. Stanley and Dr. Sly not being here today. Um, I guess that concludes the reports for today. Um, 
Old business, there is none. And under new business, we have a presentation and discussion of the Cherokee Scholarships or Scholars Program. I'd like to introduce Terry Michael. She's the director of the Oklahoma Scholars Program. And she has a brief PowerPoint. And the uh, Cherokee Scholars Program is mirrored after the Oklahoma Scholars Program. And once she does her, her presentation, we'll enter into why we decided to mirror after hers. It validates our program because there's some incentives to be an Oklahoma scholar. So I'll let her start and I will be here for follow up. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Oklahoma Scholars' mission is to increase the percentage of students taking a more rigorous course of study, particularly in the areas of math and science. Now, I want to give you a little history on this because I think it's real important. It began in 1985 in Longview, Texas at Eastman Chemical when the Vice President of Human Resources was hearing that the people they were hiring were not skilled in basic math and science skills. As you can imagine, in a chemical company, they needed those skills. So uh, Joe Randolph went down to the school and marched up to the superintendent and said, now why aren't you giving these kids the classes that they need and these basic skills? And he said, we offer them, they just don't take them. They're not incentivized to take those classes. So rather than give up and wait on a legislative mandate, Joe rounded up some business people in Longview, Texas and said, we're going to have to go in and motivate these students to take those classes. We need those people to be hired at our plant. And we need to offer them little incentives along the way. Now, business had a business need and took a simple approach to it. But as a former teacher, sometimes we require more validation than that. Well, just coincidentally, at the Department of Education, a researcher by the name of Clifford Edelman began a longitudinal study in 1980 of 13,000 students from the age of 16 through the age of 26. And what he found was the most significant predictor of post-secondary success was not grade point average, not test scores, not class rank, but it was the rigor of course taking. Let me see what I do here. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay. I have to put my glasses on. It was in technology. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a little... Uh, Humor here, okay? <laughs> That's a little one. Oh, goody. Still up on the screen on the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm having to be pulled into the 21st century by my son. It always works except for me. And that's the truth. That works beautifully. Okay, now, the little black button, is that what you said? <laughs> okay. Again, what he found was the most significant predictor. Now, where do I point it then? Okay. Thank you. Again, <laughs> one more. The most significant predictor of post-secondary success was the rigor of course taking. Number one, the level of math. You can go ahead and hit that again. Okay, let me see if I can. Wait a minute, did it do it? It says it did. Okay. It takes people smarter than I to do this. Okay, it's the lever of math level of mathematics taken, and the second was the number of science classes, particularly lab science classes. So we now have the validation from the education community about this business project. There we go. At least two. Now, Clifford Edelman's work was published in 1990 at, by the Department of Ed under um, Answers in a toolbox, as you can see the postscript on that down there. He has since revisited this 10 years later and found out, yes, these were the basics to begin with, but he's now saying that it's actually requiring in the 21st century a fourth level of math and another science here to promote what we need in our workforce. Next slide. 
Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Smart people can take care of me. Okay. <laughs> This is what the workforce looks like. I remember this mainly. I mean, I was kind of bored of the cusp there. But you can see that unskilled labor. Now, that at that time was basically on the job. I'm looking at my back. I'll look at the front now. Basically on the job training, assembly line type work. Well, as you know, with technology and robotics, that has gone down to almost nothing in that pie shape up there. And when we talk about skilled work, we're talking about intellectual skills. There are some education beyond high school all of our students are going to need. Okay. <laughs> I'm pushing the same button. Maybe it just needs to be closer. That one. Okay. We need to do That's right. Okay, and because of the complexity of automobiles and everything else, especially in physics, it's necessary for us to understand this and promote this in education. Preparing for work and college, the requirements have now converged. Okay? This is a community-wide incentive program to motivate more students to complete an academically enriched high school course of study. Now, we get, you can go ahead. We give the presentation to everybody. But our focus is on that middle 50. Those kids that are from the lower uh, socioeconomic group, maybe minority, who don't have influencers at home to promote that education. They're also the ones to want to take the path of least resistance. Uh, what we found in this, uh, these quartiles is that there is an elitism with that upper 25%. And sometimes they slack off, but they see the people in the middle 50%, their peers, taking physics, algebra 2, foreign language, and it pushes them up into the AP classes. Likewise, in that lower quartile, some of those students have been misidentified, and they've been pulled up into the middle 50%. Okay. This is the Oklahoma Scholars Core Course of Curriculum. This is what we require. There are, there's no negotiation here. Every single course must be. There's not a substitute here. You can't substitute physics with another lab science. It has to be biology, chemistry, physics. We would hope they would take a fourth science as well as a fourth uh, math. Uh, there are three and a half credits of social studies that are due and two years of the same foreign language. Okay? This is the comparison, and we'll just we'll skip over that uh, chart, Kara. Thank you. Requirement for becoming an Oklahoma scholar is to give the message to those students that normally wouldn't think of themselves as scholars, and to reward them. Um, what we do, we've aligned the Oklahoma Scholars with the OLAP program. If you're familiar with the State Regents program, the Oklahoma Higher Learning Access program so that they can get that tuition money that's offered if they complete that. Now, the scholars program is a little bit more rigorous than OLAP is, but we do require a two-point grade point average. What OLAP has found is that that requirement is not only met, but it is exceeded. Uh, I think uh, two years ago, their data showed that their average GPA was a 3.4, even though they were only requiring a 2.5. And it's just common sense that college should not be denied to anybody. But part of the reason it is is because our students are not well prepared. And maybe the next slide will show part of that. Is Well, no, not quite yet. There is a difference when, um, I, I'm sorry, go ahead to the next one. The bottom line is the economy. This is a business-led initiative. And we're trying to build a workforce here in Oklahoma. Our, we don't want our kids to leave. We want them to have a place to work, to provide for their families, to make a living. First of all, yes, we're interested in our students. And then the college provide less remediations, and employers are able to hire without retraining those students. OK. This is some of the data I have from Ardmore. And they started in 2004. Um, they uh, gave presentations to eighth graders as well as ninth graders. But the superintendent there talked to some of the juniors and sophomores into taking some of those harder classes they wouldn't normally take. So in 2006, they graduated uh, 39 Oklahoma scholars. In 2005, they had 14 students on track. 
Uh, now there's some of the uh, information there. There are 92 juniors on track and enrolled in chemistry, 125 sophomores on track with a grade point average of 2.5. I don't have the other uh, slide for this. Uh, you can go on and, and show. This is how the class size has increased. Now some of it shows it going down a little bit, but that's because they take, they're taking another class in the interim before they get to the next class. Uh, this is not on the slide, but in McAllister, they began the program three years ago. Gave presentations to eighth graders, but grandfathered in their freshmen. They did not offer a physics class until two years later. They graduated this spring 33% of their seniors with a 2.5 grade point average in this curriculum. They're already dipping into that middle 50. They have 49% um, or no, 59% um, juniors on track next year, 57% of sophomores on track, and about 62% of freshmen on track to be Oklahoma scholars. They're, so they're well into their middle 50 after three years. Okay. It's not the end-all, be-all program. We work well with other programs. We just think it's a good fit. It's a good common sense approach to helping high school reform. Okay. There are three components to the Oklahoma Scholars. The first is the Great Expectations, Great Rewards presentation. The second component is what I talked about or alluded to a little bit, incentives and support to stay on track. And the final is a senior recognition, especially for those people or those students who normally don't think of themselves as scholars. Next slide. What we do in this eighth grade presentation, we talk about global competition. Those kids sit there and they're not really thinking about competition and beyond the person sitting next to them. But we ask them to look at the tags in their t-shirts and when they say, see made in China or made in Rio, it becomes very real to them. And we start talking about, you're competing for jobs eight years down the road with somebody clear across the ocean. The second thing we talk about in there is lifespan analysis, how long they're going to have to work. And when they see it's 50 years old, they they come unglued. They can't imagine working 50 years. They can't even imagine anybody being 50 years old. <laughs> so what we try to interject there is to find something you like to do, your passion. If you're in a job you love, you'll do well. And the way to find that is to take a broad range of subjects. And then we show them the course of study. And the final part of the presentation, which is the most fun part, is a budget. It's a money message. Kids want stuff, okay? And this is just the summary of the presentation, but we go through this line item. And so what we do, am I out of time? No, you're not out of time, but I wanted to interject real quick. The presentation that she's speaking of in, this, in the past slide in this one is where we will enlist your help to go out to the schools, to the eighth grade classes, to make this presentation that she, as pre-prepared. It, matter of fact, it would be scripted if you want it to be, but we want you to personalize it too, and that's where we'll enlist you to go visit with the eighth graders in your districts. And I'll just go ahead and interject because we're getting such a late start here into the school year. What we have, what we intended to do, or what we intend to do, is to present uh, set up presentations for ninth and tenth graders, and then start with the eighth graders next year and can, uh, get on track, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so when we start this uh, presentation, we, we pretend we're going to hire everyone in the room. They're single. They don't have dependents. And we're going to pay. At this, this one, I have three different presentations money-wise, depending on what community you're in. But we started out with $24,000 a year. And they figure that out. It's $2,000 a month. And, and the screen is blank. So you've worked for me for 30 days. How much am I going to write that check for? And 85% say $2,000. And really? Yeah, and then because we give a lot of these presentations in early April, some of them are kind of savvy. They've heard mom and dad talk about that T word, taxes. So then they start going through that, but they get down to the medical and dental insurance with all those deductions before they get their check. And they're not having any fun. And they're complaining already. And of course, some of these numbers are just outlandish. As you see, medical and dental insurance, that's a joke. Now, I have revised that. And uh, 
So we keep going down and they get $40 for clothing a month and that's just preposterous. They can't possibly get by on $40 a month. And then entertainment is $40 a month. And how are they going to go to a movie? That's a weekend pass at a movie theater. Uh, and so when they get down to what they get left over is have yourself a heyday on your miscellaneous money there. They decide they're going to go back home and live with mom and dad, but we have to re-educate them and say, Mom and Dad have already said goodbye to you. You are on your own. So this is so much fun. As um, Rita has already told you, we, we're going to solicit presenters to go in there. They believe you. It's a different voice than a counselor or a teacher. Not that our counselors and teachers don't work really, really hard to, to put that message out in front. But a business person, a some, somebody that knows what the world is like, telling them the real world, they really put a lot of stock into that. Okay? Um, some of the suggested awards, and I have a list of over 200. I think I passed that on to you, didn't I? But you build this program around your community, what your community can support. Uh, for instance, we're in Durant, Oklahoma. You can't give a GAT certificate in Durant. There isn't one, but they love Walmart. So that, those are some of the ways you work around your own community. We, I provide the gold seals that go on high school uh, diplomas. It's just a nice little gold seal. What happened in Tulsa was when we started the program, um, the the business person lead there went to one of the businesses in Tulsa and asked them if they wouldn't put on their applications, are you an Oklahoma Scholars graduate? Not that that gives them the job, but they know the curriculum that they have taken. They know their basic requirements. It kind of floats their resume to the top. It does not give them a job. They still have to go through the interview. But these are very low cost uh, awards. Now the second part is what I said is the um, incentives. We have gold seals or uh, gold medals and I brought a couple of those. They look just like Olympic medals. Now I thought this was real schmaltzy when we brought this in. But this is different than a piece of paper. Kids, they're either awarded it at graduation or in a special senior assembly and they're very proud of it. It's not something they can just throw in the trash. And finally, the um, Here's some more incentives. Again, this is based on the community, community and what the community could support. Obviously, that in Oklahoma, uh, we have most of our schools are rural, and so there might not be any businesses in town. If they get the presentation, that's great, and I go for it. I I'm there to support it. But some of the places that do have and are very creative about uh, providing incentives without spending a lot of money. Um, so this is what we built on in Oklahoma. We started in 2004. We have uh, 20 sites from the largest school district, Tulsa Public School District, down to some of the smallest, as I've said. And they've done incredible things with turning around uh, motivation in these students. Um, are there any questions? And before I give this to Rita, we're going to uh, tell you how we're doing this collaboration. Thank you so much for handling the technical part. Uh, one of the things uh, that you know, one of the okay. Oklahoma Scholars uh, graduates uh, also are in line for some additional incentives as seniors. And you want to explain, I'll, I'll explain the scholarship that. program? Okay. Okay, well, again, as I've said, we aligned Oklahoma Scholars with OLAP so they can get the tuition money that's due. The students said, you know about the tuition money through OLAP. Or actually, it's not through OLAP. They manage it. It came through the state legislature. So they have, I think, six years to get a degree, a four-year degree, what we used to call a four-year degree, with tuition paid in-state so they can go to any college or university in-state. So there's another reason, if they're prepared, that no kid can go to college here. Secondly, through the Department of Ed under OBE, Oklahoma Vocational and Adult Education, funded by Perkins, under the Pell Grants, there's additional money for state scholars graduates, Oklahoma scholars graduates, Cherokee scholars graduates, additional $750 tacked on to that thousand. So there's lots of ways to go. You don't have to be a, a four points, you know, academic scholar. If you meet these basic requirements, you're prepared to go to college, you'll be successful. That's our message. And uh, one of the areas I want to make, uh, point out, uh, they require two uh, world languages other than English. 
we are going to recommend, we are not going to require it starting off, that we are going to highly recommend that they take Cherokee if their schools offer it. And then at some point, then we want to work with the schools to where uh, they may offer the class, even if it's, if we, right now we, we're running into a problem where we do not have a state certified teacher to offer Cherokee online. But we're working on that process too, so that the students can take Cherokee maybe via the internet. And so we're going to highly recommend that they take Cherokee. We, to stay in line with our initiatives, the jobs, communities, and language, we are going to give out the social studies textbook to each of the school districts along with the curriculum guide. Uh, we hope that in the future, right now because of the financial crunch, you, you really cannot put any undue pressure on schools to hire additional teachers, to put additional classes in their class schedule. But we can give them the resources and then recommend it and hopefully work things out down the road. But we would like to see the Cherokee Social Studies course as an elective that would fit in. And she did say she would give us a little leeway as one of the Social Studies areas uh, credits. But that's all in the making. You know, we have to show some success and then work with the school districts uh, to implement the Social Studies program, the language program. Are there any questions? Dr. Ross, thank you. And, but, and what is under the, the way other people implement it, what's about the average cost per student between 8th and 12th grade? You know, it, it depends on what side and what kind of business community. I think Tulsa's is $30 per student. and they oh, really like the program, right? Yes. And then in smaller schools where they don't really offer a lot of incentives, it's maybe less tip. I provide most of the training materials. So that's out, uh, with the exception of some of the um, collateral, the brochures that I brought in. But I give you a base on that. So I, and then I come out and do the training in front of a live class. And so you get to see the interaction with the kids. And, um, that is basically, you can make this as low cost as you can get volunteers into it. It takes very little to really incentivize these kids. They just want some recognition, really. They, they may not be getting it at home um, for whatever reason, or they may just be hanging out with the wrong group. And so you give them a little incentive. So let me tell you about McAllister, which I gave you some of the stats about their increases are incredible. But they really focused on yearly incentives. After that first freshman year, those freshmen got to go to the country club, the board chair of the chamber, cooked hamburgers and hot dogs out there. They hired a magician. Those kids that didn't quite measure up, didn't make that 2.5 that year, could still come back in the program. They just didn't get that incentive that year. So that was a great incentive for those kids that didn't quite make it to come back on the track. <coughs> and every year they've successfully done something that those kids want to be a part of. And that's why their numbers are increasing at a rapid rate. They also had a wonderful grant come in of a local energy company of $25,000. And they're probably going to get it every year. Now that's great to order medals. They gave the seniors this year Oh, I don't know what they're called. Somebody tell me these great calculators and graphing calculators. Yeah, and yeah, every, and pods and everything. So they get they spend a lot of money this year so that the other kids. Now eventually we hope that they're going to be motivated just because. But right now, yeah, we're going to have to pull those kids along a little bit. Our uh, incentive and support program is financed and supported by by your gift of. Uh, awarding us the SBC proposal. Uh, but we're going to work with Terry, and she uh, will work with the business communities to enlist their help also to provide additional incentives. But the incentive that we'll provide is we'll provide a T-shirt at the end of the academic year. And again, <coughs> when they are seniors and they've completed the coursework, we're going to, uh, we have designed a Sequoia medallion, and we'll present that either in a graduation ceremony or uh, an awards assembly. And in addition to that, you provided uh, the students an extra $200 scholarship for eight consecutive semesters. That was part of your vote in awarding this uh, SBC proposal. So if the students stay on track, they have additional money uh, to go to college. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. So yeah, on the, uh, the, the uh, great expectations presentation, is, is 
that part of what you're coming to the school to do, or is it at an off-site location? It will and, be. And the students go to it, or so at every school system within, say, like Mays County, you would visit that school system, do a presentation, and they would be exposed to to uh, similar type mm -hmm. information. And, and we. And then they in the eighth grade they get a check mark, and they get the kind of the the future uh, pathway that they mm -hmm. got to go down and then who's monitoring this and keeping track well of we have to I'm work with counselors You're, okay okay i have okay. i have a uh, that's, data that's input kind of and research that, that yeah no. it would fall no, back to the counselors to, to uh, uh, yes uh, kind of manage. but here's here's what i say and i know uh having been a school teacher too and everything's on your back and shoulders and everything and i say oh no not another program but if I get a chance to visit with them, I can really tell them how scholars can deliver not only scholars, OLAP, and ACE curriculum, the ones that I alluded to on the screen, is that you have the business people coming in to motivate them. The scholars curriculum is much more rigid, rigid, rigid <laughs> than the other two. So if they meet the scholars requirements, then they meet the other two. And we can help do it. The outside person here is that business <coughs> lead that comes in and motivates those kids. And yes, we come into each school, each classroom. That we do it at uh, based on class size. Usually, 25 is the ideal, you know, an average class size. Um, if you get too many more, they're either way too quiet or way too rowdy. And we want interaction. We like it when the kids shush each other. You know, they're excited about the presentation. Chris. Uh, what we would do also when you, you know, because I, I feel your pain with the counseling situation, is we would identify a staff member at this point, it's Daniel Thaddeus, to go out to the school systems and would be the contact person to pick up this data that we will track and make sure those students are staying on track. Okay. We will identify our Cherokee students. But, 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 I mean, at one time we will collaborate and at least assist <coughs> or kind of even motivate. The, 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 the in the school uh, personnel to assist us with uh, in co-op, I guess, managing this program. Because, I mean, they're, they're, their students will benefit, too. I mean, even though you're doing a presentation to maybe 50% uh, Cherokee students, you're not just doing it specifically towards them, right? It's a, it's we're we're offering Oklahoma Scholars yeah, alongside so this. It, it could be possible that some of these are already happening in some of our schools, or it's a brand new initiative? Not in this area. Okay. Not in this area. The 20 school sites are all in western Oklahoma. Right? No, they're not in western. Most of them are on the eastern. Oh, because of Tulsa, yeah. Tulsa, okay. just Sand Springs, Big okay. Feet, Sperry, uh, McAllister. I can't think of them all right now. Should have gone okay. alphabetical. Okay. <laughs> So this is a new initiative, I guess. Well, in 2004, we started it, yes. Right, right now for mm -hmm. Yes. And it's in 24 states right now. Councilor Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, will we eventually go online so even at-large citizens could potentially interact with this and do it, even though it wouldn't it'd be Oklahoma-based curriculum, but they could also try to... Well... Let me clarify okay. that and she can answer is that the curriculum is the same in all of the states. Okay, good. So that makes it even. They just wouldn't qualify for OLAP and the, the right. they could qualify for our programs and yes. the recognition and the steering. Mm -hmm. And they can still qualify for Pell Grants too. And we could even do some of the training online mm -hmm. potentially and have them go through it and agree to it and sign up online. The first year we wanted to get started in the foundation and then we hope to develop a web portal where we can do a web application similar to the presentation that we saw last month. So eventually we want to work in that direction that we want to lay the groundwork this year. And Madam Chair, if you don't mind, uh, there's a book called The Algebra Project and um, this uh, African-American gentleman with his PhD in math education who was in the civil rights movement in the South. He actually uh, has based his career on the idea that uh, reading literacy and voting rights was the initial basis of what was holding back the African-American community and, and most minority communities. And he builds a very strong case where it is completely unacceptable today to be illiterate in reading, but it's acceptable to be illiterate in math, which is holding down our communities. 
And so a curriculum like this is very exciting for me because it makes sure that you know, the economic foundation and, and that kind of literacy, which is the foundation for both jobs, um, is there for us. And that's exciting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Lana Hampton presentation. Uh, this is my co-sponsor, Joanne Spay. And uh, one council. We have a little reading material for you. And uh, as a teacher of 42 years, I love to hear anything that deals with incentives and rewards for children. Um, starting out teaching first grade, uh, I found out that rewards and incentives are the best way to accomplish anything. And I think this project sounds wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening to us today. As I said, Mrs. Spade and I co-sponsor a Native American performing arts troupe in Grove, Oklahoma. Um, we also, uh, I teach a Cherokee language and history class in which Mrs. Spade, who is a, uh, uh, well, in fact, she didn't speak English until she came to school when she was in seventh grade, or seven years old, I guess, that she comes to my class which we are getting ready for the uh, language bowl. Um, what we're wanting to do is, about four years ago, we started this Native American Performing Arts Troupe, and it was uh, formed to take our children to the grand opening of the Indian Museum in Washington, D.C. And uh, since then, uh, what, if you look down at the bottom of the second page, it gives you an idea of what our prerequisites were for. Uh, they had to have their CDIB card, they had to have good grades. And we started out with about 600 JOM students. We narrowed it down by CDIB cards and then by grades and then by uh, questionnaires. But uh, these children through the last few years have stayed in school they have kept their grades up. They have been leaders in each of their different grades. Um, they have shown us time and time again how respectful they are to people of, of uh, other cultures and to their elders. And this is uh, one of the things that we would like to reward our students with. Uh, last October, when I went to the NIEA meeting in Hawaii, I contacted some educators there, and we had talked about having a cultural exchange. The Kamehameha schools in Hawaii on four of the different islands are set up uh, kind of like our immersion programs. They are for only Native American, I mean Native Hawaiian students. And so when I talked to uh, one of the middle school principals there, she was very excited about uh, the cultural exchange. And by cultural exchange, I mean we would go there, like one of our students is working on a, a PowerPoint on language, a couple of them. And uh, we want to exchange our languages, our history, uh, clothing, foods, uh, stories, dances, and uh, what she proposed was we have 30 students and so she proposed to get about 30 of the native Hawaiian students and do this cultural exchange with them. So our students are, are very excited about this and like I told you there, none of them have been to Hawaii before. Uh, most of them have never flown before even. Uh, this was the case when we took the, uh, the students to Washington, D.C. We only had one student that had flown before then. But uh, I tried to get in as many of the museums and things for the students while we were there. And I had many students come back later and say, oh, we were discussing that in history. And I could bring that alive to them. Or in science, we've been to the science uh, 
uh, museum. And this is what I, I hope to do with these children too, is to kind of broaden their horizons. A lot of them have seen other tribes in Oklahoma, but uh, never one that's this different for them. Um, as you see, we have started our fundraising. And um, if you look on that one, there's a cost breakdown. And we're using the FAME tour, uh, which we used when we went to Washington, D.C., and our band has used them several times. And we were quite pleased with them. Um, the airfare there, they broke down 920 apiece. And the program, 989, which includes the hotel accommodations for seven days, six nights, three meals a day, all of the entrances into like um, the Arizona Memorial, any of those that we go to, they pay for those, comes out of that. Uh, bus transfers while we're there, uh, on-site assistance, etc. Uh, the program does not include the um, tips for the bus drivers. And then also uh, the two meals when we're going there and coming back that usually we have to do in the airport. And then I also requested for the kids to have two t-shirts. <coughs> Uh, before they wore one when they went, another coming back, because it's so easy when you look out there to find all the t-shirts that are like. I guess starting at first grade, I still have that little mother hen thing, you know. Uh, also, a backpack for the kids that they could use when they go on the plane and then while we're there. Uh, if you look on the next one, the payments and fundraisers, we started in uh, July uh, making $50 a month payments and my hope was that uh, the students would not have to make too many of these before we could earn enough or get enough in donate donations because many of our students this 50 a month has been a hardship uh, on their family but we have some great parents, and they realize how important this is for their child. Um, thanks to some of our donations from uh, our, uh, one of our council members, Harley Buzzer, uh, on the Cherokee Nation Community Assistance, has uh, so graciously given us $1,200, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, the total amount earned as October the 10th was $9,522. But if you look down at the bottom, last Friday, um, we took in another $158 on OU uh, football. And of course, uh, I'd like to kind of point this out, even though my husband and I attended OSU, our grandson is uh, starting football um, at OU, and he was also uh, a former Cherokee Youth Council um, in Hampton, and he's a starting um, snapper on short snaps for OU now. But uh, Ben knew about uh, what we were trying to do, and so I bought a ball, and he had over 50 of the boys sign the football for us to sell tickets on. And uh, Friday night was the first time I went through all of this at OU to get, I called and I said, now I'm a grandma and I want to make sure I don't do anything I'm not supposed to do, you know. So I had to kind of revise and do some things, but we got our okay on Thursday. And so Friday night was our first time to have the football to, to take chances on it. Um, I, I really think that this would be a positive thing for these students. And when, just like when we took uh, some of the older ones that had graduated, when we took them to the National Indian Museum and visited around, um, it, it kind of levels the playing field with some of these students. Um, you know, if they're sitting in a class, and there might be some of these that go all these places and have all these things, but they can say, well, I've been there too. 
uh, it helps their self-esteem. And uh, we would appreciate any help that we can get for these children. Any questions? Yeah, and I wish you football might be more valuable this week. Oh, no. <laughs> if you'll notice there, I said I have no idea how much we'll make on this OU football. I guess it depends if the Sooners keep winning. Yeah. <laughs> so let's hope maybe next week. But, yes, I'm, a, I'm an OSU. Uh, actually, I lived when my dad came back from World War II. I lived up there in Vet Village when I was a young I lived with my parents. I'm sure. I just want to say a little bit about uh, Lala and Joanne and Mrs. Thompson over there at Grove School System. I visited their school system, and those Indian kids are really respectful. I went in and, and we had a talk one day. And, and you wouldn't believe uh, that the amount of times Mrs. Hampton and Mrs. Spade and Mrs. Thompson put in with those kids over there. And if you probably look at the last draw, they're all Cherokee Indian kids. Well, I say all Cherokee Indian kids. They're all native, but the biggest part the majority of them are Cherokee. And I'm just really proud of these kids over at Grove because they don't only excel in this program, but the ACES program as well. I think they had three people that earned a big time scholarship by going to the ACES program. So, you know, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to make a donation to, these, uh, to the school system over there, but I'd make a uh, recommendation to donate $20,000 for this program. Make that informed the motion, Mr. Chair. Can I hear a second? I'll second it. Discussion? Okay. No discussion. We'll go ahead and vote on the motion then. All those in favor of contributing 20000 to this effort, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Um, does the motion carry? Thank you. I thank you very much for the children. That will go to executive Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any announcements this time? Well, Chair, uh, if I may, I'd like to move that we approve uh, Dr. Cobb at his request, Dr. Cobb withdrawal from this one o'clock education committee. Okay. Second. Do we need to vote on that? We do. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Other announcements? Jordan? We're having our annual community meeting at Harvard Community Center Thursday night at 5.30, and we would truly appreciate all of you dropping in. 5.30 to 7.30, the departments will have their tables set up. We're going to have a good hamburger and hot dog uh, little cookout type before we send you off to their last home game there at Harvard. And hope that maybe you'll have some footballs to, to give out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And that's us and Bill John. I'm myself and Bill John. I know you're tired here. <laughs> Can you get it? <laughs> entertain a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.